Views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello, welcome to Open, the show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm Darren Hyman. Today we're going to update you on what's happening in and around our borough. Coming up, Karina Reyes, Assembly Member for District 87. She's been hard at work since her inauguration last month. We're going to catch up with the Assemblywoman to see what changes are coming to our district. We'll have her in studio with us. After that, we'll update you on the latest news in the world of politics. Then get your sneakers on. The New York Roadrunners Open Run is sprinting through neighborhoods near you. To find out more, you gotta stay tuned in the show. And then afterwards, a young author joins us to discuss how his growing pains helped him create his own book to uplift and inspire his readers. Then an art exhibit, uh, I should say exhibit, titled Black and in Power, just held an opening reception last weekend. We're going to speak with the artists about the event. And the free run fundraiser concert celebrating Dominican traditions is also coming our way. And uh, we're going to let you know more about that a little bit later on in the show. And then in studio, we're going to be joined by a CEO of his own production company, sharing his story of spirituality and success. And then lastly, a masquerade ball before. Uh, benefiting, I should say, a great cause will be taking place soon in Harlem. So we want you to stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially open. I'm Darren Jaime, and today is Wednesday, February 20th, and you are watching Open, a live program bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to you. We also want to welcome our viewers on Manhattan Neighborhood Network, as Open is now being broadcast live simultaneously on MNN's channel. Now, you can stay connected to us via Twitter at BronxNetTV and on Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. Well, a lot has been going on through the past week. We're getting ready to take you through it right now with some Bronx updates. In national news, 16 states are suing to stop President Trump's use of emergency powers to build a border wall. Among the states, California and New York, which challenged President Trump in court over his plan to declare a national emergency in order to spend billions of dollars on the wall. The clash raises several questions, including the scope of the emergency powers granted to the president, congressional control of spending, and how far the courts are willing to go to settle the dispute. The suit, filed in federal district court in San Francisco, argues Congress controls spending, and therefore, the president doesn't have the power to divert funds. In other news, bodega owners are now calling for politicians to allow stores to package and sell recreational marijuana. A rally took place Sunday outside of a Melrose store, led by the United Bodegas of America, who urged Governor Andrew Cuomo to let bodega owners sell marijuana once legalized. Now, Fernando Mateo, the Union Bodegas of America spokesperson, said, quote, we will follow the rules and regulations. We'll make sure that none of it is broken, but allow us to be a part of an industry that is coming to the city. According to Governor Cuomo's proposal released in January, the legalization of marijuana would not begin until after 2020. Well, a Bronx man has been left paralyzed from the waist down this after being shot. Police since have re released surveillance video of a hooded man approaching and firing a gun into an SUV parked near East 199th Street and Grand Concourse and then running away from the seat. The suspect struck the 27-year-old victim in the back. The suspect is described as Hispanic or white between 20 and 30 years old. He was wearing a black jacket with multiple patches, a gray hoodie, gray sweatpants, and white sneakers. Now, anyone with information is asked to call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-577-TIPS. Once again, that number is 1-800-577-TIPS and all calls will be kept confidential. 
Well, that's all the time we have for Bronx Updates. We will be back with more Open right after this. Well, she has participated in various labor unions throughout her career as a registered nurse. She decided to run for assembly in order to advocate for workers, promote accessible health care, and support small businesses. She won that race and now joins us in the studio to discuss the happenings in her district. Following her inauguration, we welcome Assemblyman Karinas Reyes, welcoming the, I should say, representing the 87th district. And good to have you. Good to be here. Hi, Darren. Talk to me about this for a minute. You're in. We've met before. Uh, you know, it was touch and go for a bit. You were wondering about the election. Now you're in. How's it been? It's been great. It's been a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, trying to get uh, all those things that we talked about during the campaign done. Um, but we're in the middle of budget season, and it's really about um, advocating for more resources for the community. Mm -hmm. And we've been fighting to do that. Um, we last just last week we had the uh, commissioner of small businesses business services uh, we did a walk through through the district visited some small businesses um, kind of informed our, our constituents of some of the services that the city has to offer we uh, remodeled our office so we're trying to get our services up and running uh, we want to provide legal services immigration services so trying to get all those things going but of course we needed to make the space first which we did uh, we're gonna have a grand opening soon um, and it's been an exciting legislative season. We've been passing a lot of progressive legislation that's kind of been waiting on the sidelines for some time now that we have a Democratic Senate as well. Mm -hmm. And it's been exciting. Talk to me about that Democratic Senate, Democratic Assembly, because uh, first time, really, the Democrats have really had full control of uh, New York State. For you, what were you looking to see come flying through right off the bat? Um, one of the things I said while I was campaigning is that I am equivocally a supporter of a woman's right to choose, and we passed the, the Reproductive Health Act. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we passed uh, GENDA, the Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act that protects our LGBTQ communities. Uh, we banned uh, a ban on conversion therapy. Um, uh, the CCCA, which uh, ensures that health insurances can uh, pay for, for contraceptives for women. Uh, the BOSS bill that protects a woman's uh, reproductive choices at work. Um, we passed legislation to close the LLC loophole for, in terms of campaign funding, um, and we're looking to pass really um, good um, criminal justice reform as well. That's been in the talks. So when we talk about taking the issues from your district up to Albany, uh, obviously you're going to be representing your constituents, having that conversation. What are, you, what are some of the things that you really want to see that you're able to hopefully be able to drive home and bring home during this budget season? So we signed on to a letter um, requesting $250 million uh, for NYCHA funding, and we want to really want to make sure that some of that funding comes to the district. Castle Hill Houses have been having some problem with heat that we've been working really hard on to make sure that, that they um, have heat and, and Glebe Senior Center and Glebe Housing, um, but also funding for our schools and um, some of the community centers in our, in our district. So we have the Kips Boys and Girls uh, Clubhouse, which provides programming for, for young adults and, um, I'm sorry, young teens and kids. Mm -hmm. And we want to um, give them some more money for infrastructure so they can have the space that they deserve our, you know, for our kids to play and learn. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the hardest challenge for you going up towards Albany right now? The drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's... it's they spread, you get spread really thin. Mm -hmm. um, everybody wants to talk to you. Everybody has priorities. Um, everybody has an ask. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of sifting through that to see what, which of those asks really impact the community the most and making sure that you advocate the hardest for that. Mm -hmm. 
So talk to us about going forward. Obviously, a lot of work that still remains on the table. What are you going to be tackling when you get back to Albany? So like I said, um, down the pipeline, we have uh, criminal justice reform uh, packages that, we, that we've that we been talking about. Things like um, congestion pricing, funding for the MTA, mm -hmm. um, all these big ticket issues that, that we've been talking about. For me personally, um, safe staffing for the nurses and um, single payer healthcare in New York. All right. Talk about nursing for a minute. I've, as you talk about staffing and nursing, staffing up. Mm -hmm. Is that voice being heard in Albany? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, I know because you're there, but I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I make sure I, I, I bring that issue up. But it's also about having the conversation with my colleagues. I feel like um, oftentimes if people don't have somebody with the experience talking to them about it, uh, they don't understand. They don't understand the implications of not having staff in, in hospitals and, and in care centers. And having someone like myself there really uh, speaking truth to power when it comes to those issues, um, I've found that it's been more effective. So we're getting people on this side of staffing, mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure the nurses are doing the work on their own as well, mm -hmm. on the ground, and that's all part of it. You just came out of caucus weekend. Talk a little about the caucus experience and uh, your takeaways. So it's not my first caucus weekend, but it's my first caucus weekend as an elected official. Mm -hmm. So the Black, Puerto Rican, and Hispanic, and Asian Legislative Caucus uh, meets annually to um, have discussions. The, for the purpose of caucus is to, is to have discussions about um, issues that concern communities of color. Um, and traditionally, or in the past, we didn't always have as many as much representation in, in the legislature like we do now. Mm -hmm. So that was the purpose of caucus. So caucus um, allows us to have conversations about all those issues, um, criminal justice reform, healthcare advocacy, healthcare access. Um, small minority and, and women-owned businesses, um, all these issues that affect our community. So it's exciting, it's fun, mm -hmm. but there's also a lot of work and we talk about the, the, the uh, difficult issues that affect us. Yeah, a lot of difficult issues that still remain on the table. One thing that we talked about, uh, I know when we talked about it, uh, in the district was the fact of housing. Mm -hmm. and the challenge of housing and addressing the whole housing issue, overdevelopment, underdevelopment. Where do you see that going or where do you see things right now? So um, we are looking to pass, uh, the, the housing bills are up for renewal. So um, really trying to strengthen uh, tenant protections and, and bring more rent control and rent stabilization to, to the area is, is a priority for me. Um, we can do that legislatively, but we can also do that with the relationships we build and, and ensuring that um, the, the development that comes to the community really addresses housing in, in, a, in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. Lastly, before I get out of here, your constituents are going to ask, hey, listen, what can I expect happening in my district real soon? Um, so, like I said, we have a grand opening of, of um, our office. We're looking to do that March 2nd. Um, today is um, Women's uh, Mother Language uh, Day, I believe, mm -hmm. and we have an event uh, on Starling Avenue tomorrow. Um, and we're looking forward to bringing the Metro North, and yeah. that's big picture, yes. right? Yes, yes, big <laughs> um, picture. We're going to have uh, senior art classes at the Bronx River Arts Center. Um, it's uh, Dominican Heritage uh, Independence Day is the 27th, mm -hmm. so we're going to be doing some events around that, too. Oh, good. Good to have you. Welcome. Congratulations. Have you got your foot in yet? It's in. It's in. All right. <laughs> well, good to have you. Thanks. All right, seven with Karina Reyes with us here. Taking a quick break. We've got more open. I want you to stay with us. Got more show coming up right after this. And thank you for staying with us. The New York Roadrunners Open Run is a volunteer-run, community-based program 
designed by and led, I should say, designed to be led by members of each home park community. And here telling us more about the upcoming run is Michael Rogers, who is the New York Roadrunners VP of Youth Community Runner Engagement. Mike, good to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's great. Listen, as we talk, I mean, the weather's getting warmer outside. We're looking forward to that. And running is what a lot of people do and some people look forward to. But the real whole thing is really getting people moving, huh? Absolutely. At New York Roadrunners, our mission is to help and inspire people through running. And we do that through a variety of different ways. Uh, most people know us for the TCS New York City Marathon, uh, which runs through the five boroughs, including the Bronx, obviously, uh, the mm -hmm. first November, excuse me, first Sunday of every November. But more importantly than the marathon, we have races that go throughout the year, uh, including the uh, New Balance Bronx 10 miler. Mm -hmm. But where I get to spend a lot of my time and my passion is working with our youth and community programs, mm -hmm. uh, of which Open Run is one of them. So for somebody who doesn't know about Open Run, let's walk us through it. Absolutely. Open Run is a free weekly walk-run mm -hmm. uh, that happens in city parks across the, you know, the city, mm -hmm. free parks. So what we do at Open Run is we recruit local volunteers and we have a one to three mile walk run. Most of our runs are loops, so if you can do one mile, you can walk a mile. Mm -hmm. uh, that's great. If you can do two loops, three loops, whatever it may be. Um, but it's really about opening up the local parks um, for people to come out, get moving, get healthy, and uh, start being active. Yeah, so what kind of response have you gotten? Uh, it's really great. We started Open Run in 2015, mm -hmm. uh, in June, and we started right here in the Bronx uh, at St. Mary's Park. Uh, and That's I was amazing. there, and it was awesome. It was great to see so many different uh, people, uh, sizes, shapes, uh, youth, adults, uh, coming out to kind of take ownership of their park. Uh, mm -hmm. And after that, here in the Bronx, we each year we've added a park. Uh, we went from St. Mary's in 2015. We then, uh, 2016, added Cortona. 2017, we added Soundview. 2018, we added Pelham Bay. So we're really excited. Uh, across all of the city, we currently have 16 parks. We'll be adding more parks this year to get to 20. Mm -hmm. What's the difference maker for you in, in this? Because in terms of reaching people, right, it's reaching people, but it's also getting them motivated to, to actually run. And for some people, let's be honest, running is not always the first preference. Absolutely. The beauty of Open Run is that it is, as you said, volunteer-led, mm -hmm. um, but it's really accessible, and that's what we want. We do time you, but you're not going to have these big structures and you know tens of thousands of fans. Open Run is really about being in your local park, walking and running. Mm -hmm. If you've got kids, bring your kids. Uh, if your kids are in a stroller, we welcome strollers. Uh, if you have a dog, you're going to take your dog out for the morning walk, a morning run, bring your dog to Open Run. We want to remove all barriers to get people moving. Uh, it's called Open Run, but for us, it's really about movement. So mm -hmm. if you walk, that's fine. Just right. come out and get moving in your local park. Are, do you find that, you know, given the heightened times of, you know, diet, nutrition, and, and, and so many people talking about, uh, and in an elevated level, are more people taking, taking, being prone to get out there and running and doing? Absolutely. And because Open Run is, one, free, mm -hmm. uh, and it is so accessible that we can just come to your local park, um, and we also give free stuff away. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody loves free stuff. So yeah. if you come to 10 Open Runs, you'll get a free T-shirt. You come to 25 Open Runs, you get a long sleeve T-shirt. Uh, if you come once you know, a week for 52 weeks, a whole year, you get a free membership to New York Roadrunners, which gets you discounts to other events and training and things like that. So it's really, for us, it's a gateway to get people to take ownership of their lives and their physical activity and their ability. Uh, and as I said, if you can't run, walk with us. So for Bronxites right now who are watching, say, listen, I want to get hooked up with how to get connected. What do I do? Uh, you can go to our website at nyrr.org. But more importantly, if you want to go to St. Mary's or if you want to go to Soundview, Saturday morning, 9 a.m., mm -hmm. go out to the park. Uh, if you want to go to uh, Pelham Bay, it's Thursday at 7 a.m. And if you live near Cretona Park, 9 a.m., come on out and walk and run with us. It's free. We'd love to have you. Michael Rogers, our guest here. Thanks for coming by. Thank you. All Thanks right. for having us. Now, listen, once again, now if you want to sign up for the New York Roadrunners Open Run, visit openrun.nyrr.org. And uh, don't go anywhere. We still got some more show. Mike has been with us. We got some more guests coming. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Right after this. I guess sometimes things just happen. Devastating things. Your whole world changes in an instant. That's what happened to me the day my mother had a stroke.
I'm Paul George, and I want you to spot a stroke fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke fast. For all the papas out there, let's stop what we're doing and take a moment. A moment to be with our kids. They can be loud moments. Goofy moments. Sporty moments. Dorky moments. Kooky moments. Moments where we talk or walk or just hang out. It doesn't really matter. They all count. Because every time dads take a moment to be with their kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's all take a moment to make a moment today. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. In recent news, Amazon's decision to withdraw from their second headquarters building in Queens has raised concerns for both residents and politicians. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio's School Diversity Advisory Group, made of mainly parents, academics, and activists, released their report but last week. But you got to ask the question, what is in it? And tonight, seven candidates in the race for New York City Public Advocate will be in the second and final official televised New York City Public Advocate debate. We're discussing this and more with Michael Benjamin, associate editorial page editor of the New York Post. And Mike, good to have you. Good, glad to be on, John. Good morning. Hey, glad to have you. And uh, talking a little bit about this Amazon, as we talk about Amazon, obviously a lot of people were excited to some degree that Amazon decided they were coming in. Uh, the move to actually just scrap the project altogether has been met with controversy. Let me ask you, first of all, where do you stand on both sides of the aisle? <laughs> I the Pope stood on the position that the Amazon deal was uh, was was too generous and it was <clears throat> done in secret and not transparent and the government did, and Governor Cuomo and, and Mary De Blasio didn't do a good job of selling it to the public. Um, I, although we opposed the, the the Amazon deal on for those grounds, we, we we were disappointed that New Yorkers did lose the opportunity for the creation of twenty five thousand jobs and an upgrading to that area of Long Island City. Yeah, when we talk about 25,000 jobs, a lot of people say, oh, my gosh, that's a, that's, a, that's a huge number. But on the backside, numbers about taxes and the tax benefits and what it would cost New Yorkers on the backside, uh, and many people felt like it far outweighed the fact that you had 25,000 jobs coming. The bigger question becomes, now with Amazon gone, does this make it hard for New York to attract more large manufacturers? No, not at all. And part of the reason we believe that the uh, Amazon deal was was overly generous, was that New York City is its own attraction. You want to be here. There's Broadway. You know, there's a, there's a diversity. There, there is, there's the cultural, New York is the cultural center of America, if not the world. That's what people look for when they want to move somewhere. And we believe that, uh, you know, tech companies and others want to be in New York because that's where the action is. It's, it's the center of the media universe. It's everything people people want. You know, and, and, in, and, in, good, and in some areas, we also have some, some very good school. It's a place young people want to be. So we don't see New York being hurt. In fact, um, Google um, has said it's going to have another ten to fifteen thousand jobs in New York without asking for any uh, additional, uh, any new, or any uh, state uh, or city uh, subsidies to locate and expand their business here in New York. So uh, you now, when you're looking at Amazon, a, a trillion dollar company, why do they need? a few billion dollars shaved off off their tax bills. They didn't. And, and as we've learned, as it feared some, some New Yorkers, is that you know, last year, 2017, they didn't pay any uh, federal taxes. And that seems absurd to many people. Yeah, I, I know a lot of people will still be talking about this for some time to come. Uh, of course, the Amazon deal now off the table, and uh, New Yorkers are really sharing their opinion. Talk about But the point thing is they're, they're also expanding their other presence, you know, their factory, their uh, warehouse presence, other things they'll probably be doing. We're just not going to get 
the second half of their so-called headquarters. Yeah. Let me move on and talk a little bit about this race that's coming up, the uh, debate for a public advocate, uh, second and final debate. Give us your take on that, and who's showing, uh, who, who, who do you think is uh, really standing out right now? Well, I think, well, it's hard to tell who's standing out. You know, it's not a high-profile race. Uh, people, some those those with money have, have commercials on TV. Jamani Williams, Michael Blake have had a TV commercial. Uh, Don Small has had TV commercial, and she's had a presence. Each of them had a presence on social media, whether it's Facebook, it's Twitter. You know, they've got their their ads out there in, in social media. But it's still going to come down to who can bring people out to the polls next Tuesday. We, and we don't even know what kind of weather it is. I think the top three contenders would be Michael Blake. He has the most money, and he has a, a lot of uh, endorsement. Um, Melissa Mark Viverito being the only Puerto Rican woman in the race. She has that going for her as having been a uh, council speaker and having had a profi high profile and known to voters. And then Jamani Williams, who recently ran for lieutenant governor and has had a high profile for a long time as a member of the city council from Brooklyn. Uh, I think those three are the ones that have to be beaten, although I'm told that Don Small has been a major surprise in the amount of money she's been able to raise and what she's been able to do in her positions on, uh, on issues. And she's, the, uh, I guess, the only black woman in in the race, actively in the race, and on the ballot. So I think it's possible those four could, could start small, could be the surprise of the four. And I think it's, it's Jamani Williams' uh, race to lose. All righty, Mike. Well, we got to leave it there. That's why we bring Michael Benjamin on to give us the latest what's happening in the world of local politics. And, uh, Mike, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for being for having right. me. Thanks. All right, Mike Blake. Uh, I should say, I'm sorry, Michael Benjamin with us. Michael Blake is, of course, uh, in the race for New York Public Advocate. Taking a quick break. We've got more open. Stay with us. We'll be back in a few. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant! It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. I'll never forget the day our landlord called and said, read your lease. No pets allowed. My owner tells him my dog ate the lease, but that didn't work. And now I'm stuck in a shelter. But this pit bull is ready for a new crib. I'm loving, loyal, and play well with others. So don't be intimidated by all my muscles, because the biggest one I have is my heart. That's right, I said it. And we are back here on Open. Our next guest released his first book of poems titled Carl with a K at the age of 16. Today, he reflects on his journey and tells us more about the creation of his book. We welcome author and poet Carl Lawrence, who's here with us. And uh, here's a look at his book right here. And uh, good to have you, Carl. It's a pleasure. Hey, congratulations. So um, talk to me about your piece of work here. How long did it take you to get this uh, book going? Uh, man, it's a... Uh... I published it for the first time, like, while I was a teenager, mm -hmm. but my real goal was to build a business enterprise around it, a brand around it. Mm -hmm. So the what I do is to tell stories to inspire people in the form of books, in the form of music, in, a in the form of live performance. But the reason why I do it is to be a voice of truth, mm -hmm. a voice of wisdom, and like a symbol of inspiration. So give us a little bit about the reasons of why you do it, because uh, obviously you got you know some some real some real powerful reasons. Yeah. So uh, writing for me started as a form of therapy, just as a way to express my give a voice to my suffering. Mm -hmm. But then as you get in touch with your own suffering, you turn outward and look at the suffering of other people and the things that is going on in your community and in the world at large, and you want to shed shed light on it. You want to you want to expose it. Yeah. And so. For people who t take a look at the book, I mean, you got a couple of, I mean, a lot of great work in here. Walk us through what some of your favorites are. Uh, time, mm -hmm. water, animal planet, machine gun, if I rule the world, pain. Well, talk to me about if I rule the world. If I rule the world. Um, it's just trying to trying to stretch my imagination to see how the, how the world could be better mm -hmm. and uh, how I could use words to inspire a positive change in society. Yeah. And you talked about building a business as well. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I publish my books through my own company mm -hmm. and uh, my music as well. And so 
I feel like a book is a passport to other things. So like a, as an author, you write books for people to respect your mind. But when people respect your mind, you could use it as an avenue to get into education, to get into community work and things of that nature. So when you look at this situation of um, what's going on in the world today with regards to so many people out there and they seem lost and disconnected, how do you feel that your work connects with people? Yeah, so I think people find meaning and purpose mm -hmm. and direction in life through the stories, you know, and where school fails, where the culture fails, where uh, maybe your guidance at home fails, people turn to the music they listen to, the movies that they watch in order to, like, get guidance and wisdom to go through life. And so that's what I try to give people. So if people want to get Carl with the K's book, how do they do that? They can get it on my website, richradical.com, and uh, I'm going to have it available on Amazon in the first quarter, 2019. That? Congratulations there, and uh, good work good work there. For, for, somebody sure. who, for somebody who thinks about writing a book, obviously you started at a very young age. What advice do you give somebody who has that literary passion? The distance between success and failure is perseverance. That's it? Yeah. That's all you got to do is persevere. Yeah, and um, read a lot. Mm -hmm. Study. Anything that you want to do in life, Somebody has done a similar version of it before and probably written about it or spoken about it in a podcast or a documentary. Mm -hmm. So we have Google, we have a tool called the internet. You know, so you seek knowledge, you seek information, and then you persevere and it's a iterative, iter learning is an iterative, iterative process. Right. So as you keep going and you try and you fail, you, you just get better every time. Like you that. smile when you said podcast. Is that something coming up? Yeah. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can tell. I can tell. Okay, good. Carl with a K. I want to let you know his website is richradical.com. You can find out more about him uh, by visiting the website. And uh, definitely thank you for coming. If people want to get in touch with you, what do they do? Uh, they can follow me on social media, K underscore W-I-T-H-A-K dot K underscore W-I-T-H-A-K. Mm -hmm. Or they could hit me up on my website, Rich Radical. Mm. Any events upcoming you want to let people know about? Yeah, uh, so um, I'm going to have a piece in the ma online magazine Bronx Narratives, and mm -hmm. I'm getting ready to release my second book, Volume 2, The Radical Poetry of Carl Lamar Lawrence, and I plan to do events in the city. So if they hit me up on social media and follow me, then they'll see. And the, you come on back here, right? Yeah, exactly. All right, that's what I'm talking about. All right, Carl, good to have you. Carl with a K, Carl Lawrence, author uh, and a businessman, so much more, entrepreneur. Good to have him here with us here on Open. Listen, taking a break. We got more show. Stay with us. We'll come right back right after this. An art exhibit celebrating black empowerment with a collection of over 200 art pieces made in the span of 25 years from artists and curators held its opening reception this past weekend. And joining us now to tell us a little bit more about the exhibit titled Black and Empower is Kevin McDowell, who's the artist and founder of Artist Facts and Studio Gallery and Hub. And we thank you for coming and sharing with us. It was a pleasure to be here, Darren. Thank good. You. So you had a, good, a great weekend? Oh, it was an excellent weekend. Um... The show, I've done shows at my studio, Out of Fact Studio Gallery Hub here in the Bronx. Um, I've been there for about three years. Um, originally, I had some history at Neuro Show, and I moved here to the Bronx, because Bronx is where it is. Right. Um, and with this show in particular, I didn't expect the amount of impact it would have. Maybe because it was Black History Month, maybe because the title Black and Empower makes a statement. Mm -hmm. And for me, my art um, always had to say something. Um, I've been drawing and painting since I was five years old. I, you know, I did some um, freelance work here and there. Um, but as an artist myself, 
Um, I think it's very um, key that artists have control of their work mm -hmm. um, and they have that artist's voice. Right. Uh, and in this exhibit, you'll see a combination of 200 pieces of work. Um, the styles are varied, so you'll see that train, uh, excuse me, the change and transition um, over time. Um, so come on out, you'll see the exhibit, and then we can really get down to talk about business and networking, and I uh, hope you enjoy the show when you come on down. See a little bit of some of the work that you're going to be actually there at the exhibit, uh, and uh, walk us through a little bit about what we're seeing. Okay, this piece here uh, is actually a digital composition piece. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a piece that I've put together for concept design, because I'm also working on animated film. Okay. Um, this is an upcoming project. Um, in actual October, I'm doing a call for artists um, for sci-fi concept design, um, and I want to link it in to some of my own projects. This is a project, an animated film called Nuba City, mm -hmm. that I'm actually not going to give too much of the plot, right. but it's a sci-fi, futuristic, you know. Gotcha type of thing. Yeah. How long did it take you to do that piece? Uh, the piece itself only took about maybe an hour or so. Really? Yeah. That was done with a digital app. Okay. Um, this piece is called The Council. Um, mm -hmm. This piece is right now on exhibit at my, uh, at my location. Um, that is an acrylic and mixed media piece. It's acrylic and on water um, colored paper. That one took some more time to do. Um, but this piece, I actually, actually go in and do some research on our history in terms of the African tribes and try to get the authenticity with the detail. You know, um, the theme really highlights our women. Um, the piece is really about really, it's a princess, and this princess is getting counsel from her elders. Mm -hmm. And she has to go back to get that old school knowledge to say, she's a princess, she's, a, uh, she's regal, she has her authority, but she has to get that old school knowledge to uh -huh. pretty much keep things in check. So if people want to know a little bit more, or give me this one a little quickly. Uh, this is a specific piece um, that dealt with um, diversity in terms of racial identity. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of friends of mixed backgrounds, and I wanted to do a piece that kind of you know, stuck to that, the idea of um, one is of different backgrounds, how do they, um, not so much um, how society sees them, but how do they network with the conflicts in different diverse situations? Um, mm -hmm. How do they you know, make that voice that they take ownership of their identity but then it's like, you know, you're not caught in the middle, but it's like, I have my own um, myself and, 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 and find yourself and making your voice for yourself and how that identifies with the larger community. So if people want to find out more about your exhibition, uh, how long is it going for? Well, that's a good question. Um, originally, the exhibition was only for one week, but it's, um, I've extended it. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be the 23rd, um, so people could come for a closing show. But I'm going to do an extension because I got a lot of feedback, a lot of positive feedback. And a lot of people are like, oh, this black show, this is this, this black and empowered, what is it about? So I may extend the show to about March 3rd. So, but I'm going to have some special events, another paint um, demonstration for folks who want to come in. It's all free. Mm -hmm. um, maybe have some live entertainment, some music, and that kind of thing. So it takes place from Saturday, February 16th right now to the 23rd. That's the official start. And then you got a little extended play going on yes. as well. Mm -hmm. So for people who want to get in touch with you real quick, let's get the information to them. Yes, you can get in contact with me through my LinkedIn um, account. That's artistfacts at LinkedIn. Or you can get in touch with me through my official website, www.artistfacts.com. Pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure. Thank Keep you. Keep up the great work. Thank you. And i got to come by and check you out. All right. All righty then. Black Empower is being held, as we said, until March at Artist Facts Studio Gallery Hub. And if you want to know where it's located, 3835 Sedwick Avenue. Let's say it again, 3835 Sedwick Avenue, not too far from here. Don't go anywhere. We've got more open coming up right after this. Be right back. Chiru has no choice. She and millions like her walk miles a day for dirty water. But together, we can end their walk by providing clean water close by. Instead of spending hours walking to get water that makes them sick, girls can be in a classroom and moms will gain back time to care for their families. Sons and daughters can grow up strong, finally free of sicknesses. It's true. When you just add water, you change a life. Learn more at worldvision.org.
Musica Sinfonica Dominicana is a concert celebrating Dominican tradition, featuring music and written by Dominican composers. Here to tell us a little bit more are Adan Vasquez, who's the director of Association of Dominican Classical Artists Incorporated, and saxophonist Alexander Vasquez. And good to have you both. Thank you very much Thank for you. having us. Good. So give us a little bit more about this here. Uh, well, uh, we the orchestra that we have formed in, in Manhattan or in New York is an orchestra uh, formed by musicians from Latin America and Af uh, African descent, mm -hmm. African Americans. We are minorities. We want to empower the community, and, and not only by performing, by being the performers there, but also by performing music that is rarely played in New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, we focus on music written by uh, Latin American composers or, or Afro-Dominican composers, classical music written by Afro-Dominican composers, for instance. The concert that we're going to be performing tomorrow is written by an Afro-Dominican classical composer named uh, Bienvenido Bustamante, mm -hmm. who used to live here in the 60s and worked for the New York City Opera House. And uh, most of the, that history is not well known about, you know, the, the, the things that our community have been doing in New York. Um, so the concert tomorrow uh, is, is based on Afro-Dominican rhythms and um, uh, the saxophone uh, as a soloist, and that music taken from the countryside, from, from you know, to a symphon symphony orchestra. Mm -hmm. So all the music performed tomorrow is uh, music written intent, you know, for sym symphony, symphony music. Mm -hmm. It's called nationalism. It's something that was done in Europe in the 1800s, where they were taking music from the countryside. It's like Gershwin. Uh, did in the United States with Porgy and Bess, mm. taking music from the South and bringing it to a symphony orchestra. So what we are doing is basically that we are, we are, we are exposing music written in Latin America uh, in the states of New York City. So talk to me, Alexander, about your participation, being a part of uh, you know this, this orchestra and also being able to play these pieces. What's it mean for you? Yeah, I'm really happy to... <laughs> to be in this concert because uh, this is uh, maybe the most important concert for saxophone and orchestra writing in Dominican Republic. And it's a great opportunity to, to play the merengue rhythm in the concert. Uh, this concert has three, three parts, three moments, and we take the last part, uh, we finish with a merengue, a merengue rhythm that people love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. And I want to let you know the concert is taking place uh, tomorrow, Thursday, February 21st, as you see. Uh, it's going to take place at 7 p.m. And uh, the opportunity to see classical music, to hear classical music, it's very rare. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so talk about the rareness that you're able to actually bring, because you're going to be in Harlem, you're going to be over there at City College and uh, doing <laughs> it up. Well, the most important part of this concert is that, that well, we do everything uh, for free. Right. Uh, but we ask uh, for donations. And whatever money that we get at the concert, it goes towards a music school that we have in Washington Heights. We believe that, that the kids in our community deserve a quality of education. So we opened a conservatory in 2011 where we are offering uh, free lessons on, you know, violin, viola, cello, harp, uh, clarinet, percussion, with a focus of forming kids for sym symphony music. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have 135 kids. Uh, we are located in Aldo and 166. Um, and yeah, we get those funds to uh, uh, create what is called the cash flow because we get some funds from the city. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the main focus of this concert is to empower the community, especially the youth in Washington Heights. Mm -hmm. We want the, the, the young kids to see people that look like them playing a violin, playing a viola, playing a cello, playing a harp. Talk to me real quick before we get out of here. What does music mean for you, having the ability to play? Oh. My face is the heart expression. Uh, for me, is all my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I th I believe that that every people have a, a a self inside, and music can be the the way that they express. Oh, well, thank you both for coming. Thank you. Want to wish you the best tomorrow. Best wishes thank you. and thank you. Thank Come you. on back. So you have to bring the band or something to do something next time, <laughs> yeah. okay? You right. should come tomorrow for the concert. I can't be there. So I can't even lie on TV. I can't be there tomorrow. But I'll come. I promise you. You're not, you're not too far away. All right, now, for more information on the concert, 
we ask that you visit ClasicosDominicanos.com and you can get all the information that you need. Taking a quick break. We got more open. Stay with us. Be back in a few. For all the papas out there, let's stop what we're doing and take a moment. A moment to be with our kids. They can be loud moments. Goofy moments. Sporty moments. Dorky moments. Kooky moments. Moments where we talk or walk or just hang out. It doesn't really matter. They all count. Because every time dads take a moment to be with their kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's all take a moment to make a moment today. Well, Thomas, you've got prediabetes. But with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry. For bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're good? What? Oh, you still have prediabetes. Big time. Well, our next guest used his humbling upbringings to be a successful CEO of his own company. He's worked with some prominent musicians such as Trey Songs, Chris Brown, J Lo, and more. He's also given back by being a motivational speaker and an educator to hopeful youth. We're welcoming now our very special guest, CEO of Platinum Boy Records, Amadeus. My brother. Nice How to are you, man? King. A pleasure. Good to pleasure. see you, good, man. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, man. Doing great work. I'm trying. You're trying. <laughs> I'm trying. You're not trying. You're okay. doing. Amen. <laughs> Coming from the Bronx, yes, what's, it, what's, it, what's it feel like to just be repping the Bronx? Oh, it's amazing, man. It's a lot of uh, a lot of what I consider legends from the Bronx. Uh, J Lo. You got French Montana. You got Fat Joe. You got Big Pun. There's, there's so many, you know, people that represent the Bronx in a great in a great way. And I just wanted to, you know, do my thing and mm -hmm. and, rep and represent for the city as well. Yeah. So what have you been doing now? Man, uh, touring, touring with Trey Song that you mentioned, right? Uh, producing, uh, just produced nine songs on Chris Brown's uh, last album, Heartbreak on the Full Moon, uh, which went actually uh, double platinum. So I'm excited about that. Congratulations! Thank you, my brother. I have a, a residency in Vegas. I play at the number one uh, hip hop club, Dre's Nightclub in Vegas, every weekend. So I fly there, fly out on Fridays, land on Mondays. Get out of there. You know, that's every weekend. So I'm doing that and, and just you know um, empowering this as many people as I can everywhere I go. You talk about empowering people, but honestly, with the work that you do, you're you're heavy in the industry, Thank but then you. at the same time, you're also heavy in the community. Yes, yes, trying yes. To, trying to give back to kids and, right. and youth. Share. Well, I'm from the Bronx, from 169th Washington Avenue. Um, very tough neighborhood. Um, from where, you know, they say we can't be who I am today. You can't make it. And um, obviously, I proved them wrong. Uh, so I love to go back and just show you know, those kids that live where I live or where I come from that, you know, it's possible. It's possible to be great. It's possible to be successful regardless of your circumstances and where you come from. Um, so I just want to, you know, really want to push people to live their dreams. Every night, you know, when you think about it, we all dream. Mm -hmm. You know, now what your dream is on you. You know, right. whether it's a young lady you saw at the coffee stand, whether it's, you know, mm -hmm. an album, whether it's, you know, a, a sermon, whether it's a church, whatever. We have dreams, and I feel like those dreams are are meant to come true, you know, and we are to live those dreams. So I really push that where I go. And, and you combine your faith and your spirituality with what you do. Talk to us. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm from the church, man. I'm a church boy. <laughs> you know, uh, born and raised, uh, my mom's. And Give my church a shout out. What church? Oh, yeah, uh, cathedral, uh, the, uh, cathedral at Greater Faith. It's on 233rd White Plains Road. Mm -hmm. So that's where it all started for me with the drums and, and, and uh, being a musician and everything like that. And uh, I've dreamed of playing Madison Square Garden. I've dreamed of, you know, playing MetLife. And I've done Madison Square Garden maybe about four or five times. And Open up for Jay Z, open up for Usher, played uh, Staples Center, play you know a New York Giant fan. Right. So we played MetLife a few times at Hot 97 uh, Summer Jam. So it's you know, you know you, you imagine banging on the desk in, in school and getting in trouble and getting attention, playing in church, and then you know being able to uh, you know play all around the world. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's amazing, man. So what's coming up around the corner for you? Man, just working. You know, yeah. a, a lot of albums on the way. You know, it's hard to really. Uh, say what's what because you know at the end of the day artists you know can decide on what records they're going to use what records they're not going to use but i'm just getting in where i fit in man um you know young, young and may have did a lot of music uh, with ea sports mm -hmm. uh producing on 2k19 mm -hmm. uh matt 19 uh produces uh, and produce a lot of scores on espn 
uh, first take theme song, which mm-hmm. comes on every day that I watch. And yeah. uh, it's amazing to see like the highlights with your favorite athletes, LeBron James and Old El Patrick. your music. And the music is in the background. I'm just sitting, you know, at the, at the table eating breakfast with my family. Like, yeah. This is me. This is me. me. This is me. So it's a great feeling, man. Yeah, it's got to be. It's got to be an awesome. Yes, feeling. sir. What advice do you give young people out there who who, who, who say, listen, because you know. A lot of people want to be in this. Right. It's but. tough. Um, you know, hopefully you got to be passionate about whatever it is that you want to, that you want to do. That's the only thing I feel that'll keep you going and keep you moving forward. Um, and just believe in yourself and just remove that fear of I can't do this or what if I'm not as great as or what if I'm not, if I'm not as good as. You know, just be you. We all have our own gifts and, and, and talents that's been given to us by God. And I just feel like we should use them and, 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 and live these dreams, man. It's hard work. A lot yeah. of dedication, a lot of closed doors, a lot of no's, but, man, you got to be willing to kick those doors man, down. Yeah, we can talk a whole lot about listen, the no's, right? Yeah, man. Hey, listen, <laughs> got to bring you back. Yes, sir. Got to come back, Absolutely. all right? Thank but you for how do people me. get in touch with you? Uh, Amadeus PBM is on our IG, uh, Twitter, producer Amadeus, and I'm out here. All right. Tell Bishop My Michelle brother. Whitehaines I said what's Absolutely. up. Absolutely. All right, Absolutely. Man. All right, take care. Got to take yes, a quick sir. break. Listen, be back with more open. Stay right back. Stay with us, I should say. We're coming right back. <laughs> Why don't you ever see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're really good at it. (laughs) Yeah, I get it. Open up your books to page 360. Did you just look at your phone while you was in class? You played yourself. Talking about inspirational quotes. You gotta believe in yourself. Don't ever play yourself. The key is to make it, so make it. Louise, Louise, can you give me an example of an inspirational quote? Don't play yourself. The key is to make it. And who said that? I did. Now that's a major key alert. Learn the real major keys to getting to college at GetSchool.com. We are back here on Open. The 6th Annual Harlem Haberdashery Masquerade Ball is presenting a night of glamour and giving with proceeds from the night benefiting the Boys and Girls Club of Harlem. Joining us in the studio to tell us more is Shay Wood, President and CEO of the Harlem Haberdashery Masquerade Ball, and Ms. Dominique Jones, who is the Executive Director of the Boys and Girls Club of Harlem. We welcome you both to the show. Thank you. for having us. Good. As I started talking about, exciting time. You guys are getting ready for the ball. We are very excited to invite everyone to our sixth annual Harlem Haberdashery Masquerade Ball. Uh, This year, our beneficiary is the Boys and Girls Club of Harlem, our community partner, so we're really excited. It's um, Saturday, March 9th, 7 to 11 at Riverside Church. It's um, a great uh, time for fun, fashion, and philanthropy, so we're really excited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for this, uh, as the proceeds go to the Boys and Girls Club, you're shaking your head like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> so, for people who don't know about the Boys and Girls Club, of course, I do know. But tell people a little bit more about the Boys and Girls Club and the great work you guys do. Well, thank you. Boys and Girls Club of Harlem is really pleased to be um, the beneficiary of Harlem Haberdashery's Masquerade Ball this year. It helps us to provide um, youth development programming across the Harlem community. Currently, we serve over 1,000 young people um, in grades kindergarten through the 12th grade. And we provide activities that promote academic success, health and wellness, and strong leadership and character skills. So we're really excited to be able to um, engage with an important community partner to help us advance our mission. Mm -hmm. And this strong community partner, Harlem Haberdashery, talk about Harlem Haberdashery. Well, Harlem Haberdashery is at 245 Lenox. We're an award-winning bespoke boutique, family-owned and operated. We're celebrating our eighth year in business. It's part of a larger uh, family legacy that we're building. Um, 5,000 Flavors is our 
parent company. We work with a lot of artists and entertainers. So Harlem Haberdashery is the retail expression of that. Mm -hmm. And we are a family business, so we're definitely committed to community initiatives and working mm -hmm. with uh, community partners that really uh, work um, you know, with the next generation of Harlem youth. Right. You got great boots on the ground there in Harlem. I mean, you know, as I tell people, I'm always born and raised, and mm -hmm. I know. Uh, and the staple has been the Boys and Girls Club. Talk to us about yes. um, really how you guys have been able to meet that current changing trend that, that, it, that continues to change as the years go on, but you guys still remain relevant. Well, uh, we remain relevant because of folks like you who give us the opportunity to tell our story. We started 38 years ago with um, the members of Convent Avenue Baptist Church founded our clubhouse mm -hmm. because they wanted to respond to the emerging needs in the 80s of kids being engaged in negative behavior negative activity and so we continue to help to ensure that kids are not connected to negative activity and really given positive opportunities to express themselves similar to those folks we've had on the show today mm -hmm. with whether it be artistic expression or literary expression um, giving the kids those opportunities to be able to um, be their best selves and show their best selves to yeah. the world so Shay, give me a little bit about the masquerade well, um, DJ Olivia Dope will be our DJ. It's a f fun, fantastic time. Um, definitely dress your best, but also dress your best in support of a, a strong community partner that we support. So it's not just about um, looking great. It's about um, you know looking good, but also living good and giving back. Um, you know, definitely check Harlem Haberdashery out, Haberdashery NYC. Um, we are a you know, a wonderful retail boutique, but we're also really committed to uh, working with community partners. Right. And so if people want more information about the Boys and Girls Club, what do they do? They can go on our website, www.bgcharlem.org, and they can learn more about our programs and how they can get involved. Uh, we love to have more folks come and volunteer, like our friends at Harlem Haberdashery do every year with their backpack giveaway, mm -hmm. as well as their participation in oh, so our tutoring a program. Too, huh? Yeah, so when I say community partner, we definitely have a, a year-long relationship with the club, mm -hmm. and they benefit from a lot of the initiatives throughout Take Care of Harlem uh, program, so it's not just a one-off. We definitely are committed yeah. to working with Dominique year-long and the, and the kids there, mm -hmm. so our um, Cool for School backpack um, and school supply giveaway, they're definitely our beneficiary for our toy drive. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, any and all things we, we can do to support each other, we will do. Mm -hmm. And we so appreciate them and what they do every day. We're glad to have you both. We hope you have a successful masquerade ball. And, well, uh, thank you. And tickets are available at harlemhaberdashery.com. Good. So I want to make sure I was going to get to that, but you got it coming. <laughs> so harlemhaberdashery.com is where you can get the tickets at. Dominique, thank you so much for coming. Good to meet you. And uh, we want to make sure that you come on out and celebrate and support the Boys and Girls Club of Harlem. And unfortunately, guess what? That's all the time we have for today's show. Oh, man, all our guests here today, we want to thank you for joining us, you, the viewer, for tuning in. Now, guess what? If you missed any part of today's show, you can catch Recablecast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Optimum's Channel 67, Verizon Files Channel 33, or anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. Special shout-out to all those who are watching on the uh, MNN channel, particularly I know my sister's there and a few other people, and thank you for watching. All of you, thank you. And that about wraps it up for this episode of Open. Darren Hyman, make sure you keep this channel wide open. Rena's going to be back on Friday with a brand new episode of Open. Till then, take care. God bless. We'll see you soon.